שלום לכולם, הרצאה שלישית ואחרונה, אם אני לא טועה, בחלק שלי של הקורס. אז מה שעשינו, ההרצאה הראשונה, אני דיברתי איתכם על פיזיקה של צברים, וה... זה מוקלט. כן, באנגלית. You have to uh, lecture in English. And he said, but what language was I talking? <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So, um, this is the third, uh, last lecture in my part of this uh, course. And uh, the first lecture was about uh, an introduction to cluster science. Uh, the second lecture was about ion traps and ion optics in general. And now we're going to bring these two um, things together and we're going to talk about cluster thermodynamics, and we'll see that using ion traps, uh, we can do all kinds of uh, funny things that have to do with cluster thermodynamics, okay? But this, um, this title is a little controversial. Why? Because what is the definition of thermodynamics? And not the definition that uh, many students have that it's a boring part of physics. Macro, ma macro scale. Uh, yeah, that's a good definition. By the way, I think the thermodynamics is one of the be most beautiful courses I took in my undergraduates. Um, and thermodynamics is defined as the, as the field of physics that deals with systems th that have an infinite number of particles. Okay. Now, it's true that no system has an infinite number of particles, but a glass of uh, water or Coca-Cola has uh, an Avogadro number of, uh, of molecules inside, which is 10 to the 27. That's pretty close to infinity for all practical purposes. Okay? Now, clusters, they can have a number of particles between uh, 2 and, I don't know, 5,000 or something like this. The upper bound is not really define where does a cluster start and a nanoparticle or a solid begins, but it's much lower than infinity. Okay? So, um, so, so, so many people will say that the word thermodynamics is not the right word to use. Um, the, a better word would be statistical mechanics, because statistical mechanics is, uh, the idea in statistical mechanics is to take a um, uh, um, to, to take the mathematical theory of probability and use it to define the concepts that we use in thermodynamics, like temperature and heat capacity. Okay? And what's nice about statistical mechanics is that it works for any size of system. Okay? You can uh, define temperature for a two-level system. And a two-level system is, is the simplest uh, interesting object we can think about. I mean, a one-level system is not very interesting. Okay, so, uh, so statistical mechanics works even for small clusters. Um, but uh, I like to be provocative, so I, I like the word thermodynamic, cluster thermodynamics. Part of the reason is that many things we see in bulk, we also see for clusters. And we gave an example about cluster melting. So if you open a book then uh, about thermodynamics, they'll explain to you that um, phase transitions can happen only for systems that have an infinite number of particles. Okay? But, and, and a classical example of phase transition is melting. Okay, so you take your Coca-Cola, you put it in a freezer, and once, once the temperature drops to zero degrees, there's a phase transition. It turns into a solid from a liquid. Um, according to textbooks, this happens only if the number of molecules inside here is uh, infinite. But you can do the experiment with clusters, and you see phase transitions. They're not first-order phase transitions or second-order, but, 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 but uh, the science behind it, I mean, this definition of what is first-order, second-order, maybe that's uh, more for theorists than in, for experimentalists. Um, experiment. But, but the core thing that happens is you have definite phases and you can have a transition between them. So I call it a phase transition. Okay, so 
one uh, reason to talk about statistical mechanics and thermodynamics is that you would like to see to do a thermodynamic experiments on small systems, uh, uh, like stubby melting, like I showed you. A second reason is sometimes there's no way out of it. There, you, you have no other choice. So I'll give you a, an example from the beginning of my scientific career. What happens often in, when you do science is uh, you do an experiment when you don't know the theoretical background. So what, was, what I was doing, I was storing a cluster of four atoms of aluminum, aluminum four minus. I was uh, storing them in a trap. And I wanted to measure how they, what happens to them when they absorb a laser. Okay, I want to, wanted to measure their photo detachment. So what you see here is you have ions in the trap, and the ions that fly out of the trap, the ions that you lose, <coughs> that, those you count on a detector. Those, uh, sorry? You count on a detector. Okay. So you have this trap that looks like two mirrors, and the ions are going uh, up in the trap. And if for some reason some ion is because it breaks apart, then the neutral part goes straight and hits a detector. Okay? Now, if you don't fire lasers, then you lose some of the ions because of uh, residual gas collisions. What is residual gas? So um, the trap is in very good vacuum, but it's not perfect vacuum. So even in, this was in a pressure of 10 to the minus 10 torr, so that's ultra high vacuum but it's not perfect pressure, so there is a little bit of gas molecules, and when you collide with them, then you, you become neutral and you fly off, and these are these counts over here, and this is an exponential decay. But when you, when you fire a laser, then you see a lot of counts that, be that come from the laser. Okay, so this was a laser at 10 hertz, so every 100 milliseconds, you see counts because of the laser. And uh, what I wanted to do in the experiment is to put a window and say, okay, all the counts in this window are from the laser, and, um, and, and, and then I know what's the signal and what's the background. And it's good to put the window as narrow as possible, because then you don't have a lot of background in your window. So I, uh, I started looking for the window with, with, uh, with a oscilloscope, and I didn't manage to put a window. So we decided to measure what's happening here. Why can't I find a, a narrow window to see these counts? What I saw was that, uh, that if you blow up this region over here, then you get something like this. So the laser hits over here. Zero time is the time of the laser. And you have a lot of ions that absorb the laser and fly off. But some ions, they absorb a laser here, do one oscillation in the trap, and only then break apart. Okay? And this is the second point here. And some lasers, some ions absorb a laser, do two trap, two revolutions, and then you here have this point, and, and so on and so forth. And some of the ions, they absorb a laser, and only <coughs> 400 microseconds later, they break apart. Okay. Now this. Now, this is this is was my first. Uh, well, okay, my second experiment. So I didn't know anything about the literature, and for me this looked impossible. Why? Because this time scale of 400 microseconds is much much longer than any time scale within the cluster. Okay. So. Uh, for example, what is the time scale for vibrations of a molecule? Nanoseconds. Um, what did you say? Nanoseconds. Again? Nanoseconds. Not nanoseconds. They're much faster than nanoseconds. They're about picoseconds. So nanoseconds is 10 to the minus 9. Picoseconds is, so they're sub-picoseconds, so hundreds of femtoseconds. Okay? That depends on the molecule. It depends on the molecule and so on, but this is the order of magnitude, okay? So uh, some molecules it would be 50 femtoseconds, some will be 500 femtoseconds, but it will be on the picosecond time scale. This is between two energy levels? This is mm -hmm. the vibration frequency. Okay, it's like our harmonic oscillator. 
So the, when the molecule does like this, it's like a harmonic oscillator, and it has a frequency. Okay. And this frequency is, is the typical time of motion of the atoms inside the cluster. Okay. So this motion, so the motion of atoms inside the cluster, this is on the sub picosecond time scale. Okay. You also have rotations. So the molecule does like this. This is many picoseconds. But still, picoseconds is 10 to the minus 12 seconds. This is 10 to the minus, almost, it almost reaches milliseconds. So it's 10 to the minus 3 seconds. So we have nine orders of magnitude difference. Okay, this is, was crazy to me. It's like someone gives you a, a slap on your face, and two years later you go like this. That's, that's uh, how it sounded to me. But in molecules, only near the center, it's parabolic potential, like oscillator. Maybe other ways, the potential is different, no? Yeah, so, so sure, vibrations of molecule, it's an unharmonic oscillator, not an harmonic oscillator. And that means that the frequencies, they uh, become smaller. The, so, sorry, the, um, the en energies become smaller, so the frequencies also become smaller, uh, but not not seven orders of magnitude. They become smaller by a little bit. Okay. So what, what's going on here? Um, seven orders of magnitude. So uh, yeah. So so this is the um, the time scale. So motion of an electron happens on a sub femtosecond. Vibrations are on the hundreds of femtoseconds. Rotations on the picosecond. But dissociation can happen on many, many different time scales. It, it, it's, it, does it go by power law or something? It's yeah, so, so this, uh, the shape of this, that's a good question. We will talk about it more later. But what you can see is that this is a log scale, so it's not exponential. And uh, yes, it looks similar to a power law. It's a power law that is cut off. Have a fat tail distribution or something. Mm -hmm. um, you said it's power law. You said it's power law that it's cut off. That is the tail. It begins like a power law and becomes like exponential, or it's yeah. like a vice versa. It becomes it starts like a power law and becomes an exponential. Okay, so um, so this is is really crazy when you look at the time scales. Okay, anyone uh, who's not who doesn't do the course in chemical physics have a idea how this has happened, how this, what causes this? So in this case, dissociation is uh, an electron comes off, but it can also be that the molecule breaks apart. And this will also happen on, on, a, on, the, on a time scales that go over all this range. So like you say, it's a power law. So some molecules will dissociate right away. Some molecules will dissociate a long time later. Yeah. Maybe it's like a micro gal when I'm uh, heating the water, so it will be the same, the same uh, resonance, so it will make it uh, up. No. No. Yeah. I learned that uh, for a fat tail uh, distribu distribution, the mean is um, the mean diverges, so we have a uh, very uh, big jump between two emission events. So a levy distribution. Uh, yes, it's a levy distribution, but we didn't learn why. I mean, okay. So so. Uh, so that has to do with Brownian motion, and uh, I won't talk about this, uh, about diffusion and stuff like that. Even though maybe you can find some very, just, uh, very strange connections, but but uh, um, yeah, you're, oh, yeah. Necessarily, dissociation has something to do with rotation and vibration. No, I, I'm. Be from something else. Yeah, I, I'm. I'm saying, what can cause it? Okay, so uh, in physics, always when you do an experiment and you measure something, you don't have a theory. So the first thing to do is compare it with known time scales. So if you look at, uh, <coughs> if you make some measurement on me, then uh, uh, like how fast I uh, throw a basketball. So you can compare it with the typical time scales for how long does it take my muscle to move. Okay, and that will. Maybe you won't get an exact theory, but you'll get the right time scales. 
So here's something that the molecule does. It emits an electron or breaks apart. And the first guess would be that it would be one of these time scales. So emitting an electron, you would expect it to be on the time scale of electronic motion. But it's much, much slower than that. Power, for power laws, we learned that it indicates that you have a very complex system of complex. It's, it's something. We'll get to that. So we'll get to that. But we'll, we'll get to that. So uh, here's one uh, one clue that it has to do with something very complicated. Yeah. So maybe it's connected to the fact that you are in ultra high vacuum. So most likely the molecule will have no interaction with other molecules and parts which absorb the energy. It will start to rotate or vibrate according to the energy, but it won't, but it will keep doing it. Uh, there's nothing that will stop it from doing it, so it, it will do it until it will coll it co collide with some other molecule. And this is time scale of a uh, much Okay, you're very close to the explanation. So uh, I won't repeat what you said because in a second we'll, we'll, we'll say it. Do you have a? Okay, all of you are very close. You're, you're very smart people. Okay, I'll give um, another example of an, uh, of an experiment. Um, so, this is an experiment where you produce a molecule called SF6 minus. Now, SF6 is a molecule, is a molecule that really likes to pick up electrons. And uh, for that reason, it's a very good electric insulator. So uh, whenever you want to keep high voltage without breakdowns, then you use SF6. So for example, the big particle accelerators you, used to have a balloon full of SF6 where the, all the high voltages are. Probably also here in the, in the nano in the accelerator, it's like this. And, and the electric company also uses SF6 in their transformers. Um, so one question that was very important is, let's say an SF6 catches an electron then how long will the electron stay attached to SF6? How long will it take the electron to, uh, to come off? So, um, so the experiment one, you, one can do, it's really annoying that people are coming uh, 10 minutes uh, or 15 minutes after the beginning. So, so an experiment to do is to um, produce this molecule, SF6 minus, so SF6 with an extra electron, and measure how long it survives. Okay, So um, people did this experiment. So they produce SF6 minus, and they accelerated towards the detector. And they saw that not every, all the molecules that are produced reach the detector, Okay, because some of them fragment in the way. And then from the how many fragmented on the way, they could tell um, what is the lifetime of SF6 minus. And what's strange is that over the years, many, many people made the, this kind of experiment, and they got very, very different time scales. So in 75, they did the experiment, they got 50 microseconds. Then a different experiment later got 2 microseconds. And then they, uh, a, a different experiment in 2005 said, okay, it's between 1 and 10 <coughs> milliseconds. So very, very different time scales. For so what's going on? And so it seems that every experiment that measured this lifetime got a different uh, result. Maybe they didn't have enough big clusters. Sorry? Maybe the system wasn't big enough to have a stable uh, mean. Yeah. So what? Um, So, so these experiments were finally resolved when you measured the lifetime of SF6 minus in an ion trap. Okay? 
And why is a, an ion trap good? Because what you, so when you say that, when you talk about the decay rate, then you assume that something decays exponentially, okay? And when you, but when you study it in an ion trap, then you can study it as a function of time, and then you can check if, it's, if it decays exponentially or not. And what happens when you measure this thing in an ion trap, Okay. Is that you get again? If this is a log, um, a log scale, as a function of time, then on a log scale, an exponential decay should look like a straight line. But instead, we measured a power law. If you plot it on a log log scale, then you get a straight line. So if it's log of counts as a function of log <coughs> of the time, then you get a straight line. Now, if you have a power law decay and you measure just the counts after a specific time, <coughs> then and you from that you get a rate, then the time you measure will give you the rate. So if you measure at this time, then you think that it's an exponent that is very fast. But if you measure at a long time, then you think it's an exponent that is very long. And that's the reason that for 50 years people measured, and each measurement got a different value. Because if they measured with a, after a long time, they thought that the decay is very long. If they measured after a short time, they thought the decay is very short. There was a question behind? Yeah, so, so, um, so you need okay. to have like, some control for that. I'm yeah, sure so when you do the experiments in ultra-high vacuum, then, um, then the, the molecule is very well defined. The one thing that is maybe different from experiment to experiment is how, how hot the molecule is <coughs> to begin with. And that was the second uh, part of this experiment. First of all, the first discovery was it at power law. The second thing is that by different source conditions, by starting the molecule at different temperatures, even the power law changes. So you can, so the slope of the power law can even can also change. So, uh, so that relates to what you said. Okay. So this also, but this also brings us to this question about how can the molecule not decay after a certain time? It can decay after very very long times that are much longer than all the dynamic uh, degrees of freedom within the molecule, and, uh, and, how, and why is it a power law? So the idea to explain it, so, let's, so with a laser it's called, if you fire a laser and then measure how a long mole molecule fragments, it's called delayed dissociation. So this could be delayed electron <coughs> and it could be delayed so what happens is the following a molecule or a cluster absorbs a laser and the laser excites an electron because the only thing that can respond quickly to a laser is an electron. So you have your molecule, and it absorbs a photon and goes to the excited state. Then you have a process that's called internal conversion. Internal conversion is a process where the, en the, the electronic energy is transfer transferred back to the electronic <coughs> ground state, and all the extra <coughs> energy goes into vibrations. What it means now is it heats up the molecule. Okay, so now you take your molecule or your cluster, and and this, let's say you hit it with a photon that has 600 nanometers. That's 2 eV. All this 2 eV goes into heat. Okay, into vibrations. 
Now you have a molecule that is very, very hot. So, one. It's, it's not coupled to a bed. It, it has, but it has many vibrations, and the vibrations are like a bath. Okay. So I'm talking about the bath of the vibrations. So the first step is photon absorption. The second step is internal conversion. And now, so now you have you. Your energy is dissipated on, on many, many degrees of freedom. And there's a small probability that the energy will go in the other direction. So, so maybe the electron can go back up here and then be emitted. So this happens, but there's a very small probability for this to happen. And this small probability is what gives you these very long time scales. Okay? Can you repeat? So, Okay, let, let's, do it, let's do it like this. Let's say this is uh, the molecule in the ground state. This is the molecule in the excited state. And this is a neutral plus a free electron. Okay. So if you go from below here, you're up here. Now from here you can go like this, and then an electron is emitted. And this will happen right away. Out to seconds. But maybe instead of going straight here, you first do internal conversion. And now your energy is dissipated among many, many degrees of freedom. So you're running around a very complicated landscape. And there's a small probability that from here you'll go into here. Okay? And, th and this small probability is what gives you these very long time scales. What can what can bring the electron back? So it's what the same process. It <coughs> yeah, so it's the same process like internal conversion, but it happens in the opposite direction. But from who is taking the energy? So all the vibration, the energy is in the vibration. You have enough energy, but it's dissipated on many vibrations. And if all this energy somehow comes back to the electron, then the electron can go away. Okay? okay? Thank you. So, Usually what will happen, so here you have many degrees of freedom, here you have very few degrees of freedom. So usually what will happen is a system will go from few degrees of freedom into many. The opposite can happen, but it has a very low probability. Low probability means, it won't, doesn't mean that things don't happen, it just means that they happen very, very slowly. Okay? So, so this is called statistical statistical dissociation. What would happen if you would increase the intensity of the laser? I mean, uh, would, if, if we would uh, increase the intensity until uh, it will saturate the, the energy that uh, is dissipated to the rotation. Uh, yeah. So, will, will it uh, um, instantaneously emit a photon, or what? Will? Yeah. So what you'll see is when you increase the photon energy, then when it goes down, it goes higher up. So you increase the temperature, and when it's hotter, then the opposite process also happens faster. <coughs> okay. So the more you increase the photon energy, the faster the decay is. Is it the frequency or the intensity? Sorry? So you increase the, the frequency if you do that? Yeah. Like the laser's frequency? It's all of these, and yeah. I mean, here it's a single photon. If you absorb two photons, it's like absorbing one photon with twice the energy, and then the decay is much faster. Um, okay. okay, when you increase the laser intensity, then you increase, yeah, you the, increase the number of photons. Then you increase the probability to absorb more than one photon. Okay? So, um, so, so then also the decay will be faster. Now, in the case of SF6 minus, you don't have the photon absorption in the internal conversion. You, you start right away with the hot molecule, and then you have the statistical fragmentation. Then you do this. So you start already here, and you go up here.
So how do you uh, explain these processes theoretically? Who here has not taken a course in statistical mechanics? You, are you from chemistry or bio? From physics? Sorry? Engineering and physics. Engineering and physics. Okay, so... Um, <laughs> but but you, did, did you do uh, thermodynamics? Yeah, I'm doing that. You're doing now statistical mechanics? No, thermodynamics. thermodynamics. Okay. Okay, so some, some of the things I'm saying you'll have to believe me. Okay, so, so how do you explain this, um, this phenomenon? So let's talk now not about emitting an electron, but about a molecule breaking apart. For instance, a cluster throwing out one of its atoms. Okay, so, um, so throwing out one of its atoms means you start here at the ground state and you want to go over some barrier, and then, and then, then uh, one of the atoms goes away. So what will be the rate for this process? So one uh, like a simple way to to explain this is to say the rate that you break apart is scales is the probability that you'll be in this point. This is called the transition state. So you have to get here, and then from here you you have to move in this direction. And the probability to be here, um, according to the Maxwell uh, Boltzmann distribution, it has to do with your temperature and with the height of this barrier. Okay? So if your temperature is just a little bit above the barrier, then, I mean, if the temperature is below the, below the barrier, you won't fragment. But if it's slightly above, then your probability to get to be here is very, very low. And therefore, it will take you a very, very long time to fragment. And if you're way above, then, uh, then you'll fragment very quickly. So the probability goes like the Stefan Boltzmann distribution, and then the rate goes according to this formula here that's called the Arrhenius decay law. And what you can see is it, it goes like the barrier energy divided by K Boltzmann in an exponent. An exponent means that if you change, for instance, the temperature just by a little bit, then the rate can change by orders of magnitude. The derivative of the of p. Uh, so so no. What I did is uh, I said this is the probability to be here, and then the rate will be the probability to be here times the velocity in this direction. <coughs> so so th this gives you the rate. Okay, it's hand waving. I'm not pro properly explaining. And this uh, formula here is well known from chemistry. It's called the Arrhenius decay law. So uh, this. A here is called the Arrhenius, uh, um, Arrhenius coefficient. And the way you can actually uh, see that it works is you can measure K for different temperatures. And the nice thing to do is to plot log of K as a function of 1 over the temperature. And then you should get a straight line. So here's a very nice demonstration of this for vanadium clusters. So. Uh, these are, are clusters of a metal called vanadium, and um, the different lines here are different cluster sizes. So these are the smallest clusters, so they decay the fastest. And if you measure the <coughs> lamb of the decay rate as a function of 1 over the temperature, then you get straight lines. And, and then you can get both the Arrhenius decay law and uh, decay... Uh, yeah. So... Um, so when you do ln of both sides, it will be A plus EB. So the EB will give you the slope. And um, so this is a nice way to measure what's the binding energy of a molecule. Okay, so, so by plotting ln of K as a function of 1 over T, the slope gives you the binding energy. Okay, a second way to 
to so we just have some maximum with the vanadium. Sorry? In a very, very large uh, systems. It reached to a, in a maximum slope or? Yeah, I mean, uh, I think. So what, what you'll see here is that eventually you su it's supposed to be, so this is the binding energy here is the energy to take out one atom. Now you expect that for very large clusters, then this energy will be independent of the size of the cluster. Okay? But you have to notice that there is this phenomenon of magic numbers. So for, s for certain sizes, the cluster becomes very, very stable. And uh, <coughs> so for instance, this one, <coughs> if you go from here to here, in the middle, you change the slope uh, very quickly. Um, Why? This, and this is because of this phenomenon of magic numbers. And magic numbers persist even to hundreds of uh, atoms. So uh, yes, eventually you'll, you'll be right. But what is eventually is something that's not very well defined in, in science. So, so uh, as far as we could do the as science could do the experiments, we don't see it reach the bulk value. Do I have a limit? I see it's a, it's approaches a limit, or it doesn't approach a limit. Intuitively, yes. Practically, we we don't have the. In most cases, we don't have the possibility to measure until it gets the limit. Yeah. Why do, why do you see this? Dependence on the cluster size in small systems. I mean, it, I don't see it from the formula for, for k. Yeah, so no, no. The, the, it's it's because E b depends on cluster size. But that's the binding energy. That's the binding energy. Atom. Yeah, but okay. So let's say you have a two atom uh, two oh, atom cluster. Okay. It has one binding energy. If you have a three atom, then every atom is bound by two. So it increases. So uh, so there is a so EB will scale. Mm -hmm. And this is actually a much better measurement than just measuring the abundance, what I showed you in there. Uh, another question. If this, for example, if we take the vanadium in a uh, uh, put it in uh, with more materials, doing the new material, I have to see this effect, or I won't see it. <coughs> uh, then it becomes very complicated. So uh, it could be more stable, less stable. Uh, no, there's no simple answer to your question. So, okay, there's another way to model this uh, this behavior, and maybe if this statistical, this Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution is uh, didn't convince you, then there's another um, theory that chemists like to do. And the idea is, let's look at our cluster or molecule as a bunch of springs. Okay, so we, ha we have atoms and we have springs that connect them. Okay, and it doesn't have to be in a line. It could be uh, a cluster like this with many <coughs> springs and uh, also a spring between this and this and so on. In principle, between every two atoms there is a spring. But I, I drew it like this just so you can see it more clearly. Okay, now let's say that energy is quantized. So energy comes in uh, discrete quantas. And um, so if you, so the energy inside the molecule would be some n times the number of quanta. And let's say that if n quantas of energy are in a single spring, then the spring will break. Okay? So now what, <coughs> so now the idea is you, you take these, Let's say you have some, some quantas of energy, n, and you throw them randomly into these springs. Okay? So if by chance in one of the springs there is more, there is more than m quantas of energy, let's say it takes two, two balls, to, two quantas of energy to break the spring. So I, now I threw three balls at the board. So if the balls are one, one here, one here, and one here, nothing will happen. But if there's two here and one here, then this spring will break. But they're coupled, so how can you have... Ah, just a second. Okay. <coughs> so the first thing is you throw randomly the balls. Now, if it breaks, it breaks. If it doesn't break, then you can now have a process called IVR, which is called 
uh, intramolecular vibration redistribution, it means that these, these quantas are now starting to move around the cluster. Okay? So you, let's say you have one here, one here, and one here, and then this one jumps here, and this one jumps here. Oh, suddenly you have two here, and the spring breaks. Okay? So now you can do um, a calculation of probability. In, so you can assume that this motion is completely random, and then you can measure, you can, uh, the time it takes for it to break will go like the probability of having n out of these n quantas in a single spring. Yeah? But if I think of the, I mean, I, I'm thinking of solids, and then you have, if you have a string of, uh, of springs and you have a phonon model, so yeah. I mean, you, you don't think of localized uh, quantas of energy in your string. I, I agree. But, um, so why, but why does it work in this? So it, model. yeah. So um, so in, so when you have uh, when you have a, a system that is finite, then the harmonic modes are are um, are not harmonic; they're unharmonic. And then you all, you have many localized phonons. Okay. So so in principle, uh, what Elon is saying is is um, Usually when you talk about vibrations, they're coupled, so a mode will not be just here. A mode will cover the whole molecule. But uh, you will also have many modes that are very local. So it is a good picture. Okay, so this idea is called the RRK theory. And if you do it quantumly, it's RRKM. And these letters are just the initials of Reis, Amtsegel, and I forgot the other two names of the guys who, who came up with the theory. Yeah, you're so if the if the cluster is small, so I have a bigger probability to the molecules jumps one or the other. Or yeah, so if your cluster is small, for instance, it's a two atom cluster, only one spring, then it will either break or not break. Okay, and then you won't you 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 don't expect to see this. If it's a four atom cluster, then it has already three times n minus six, so three times four is. 12 minus 6, it has 6 degrees of freedom. It has 6 springs. And then you already can see this, uh, these kinds of effects happening. Yeah, but it still uh, distributes evenly between all the strings. Or I have uh, strings in the end and strings in the middle. So, it's so this is like the simplest theory you can do. Okay? Uh, it's not exact. It's a simple theory. It gives you orders of magnitude, not more than that. Okay, but it's it uh, it's very useful for chemists. Um, now this also <coughs> gives you a rate of decay, and if you uh, um, this for a given energy inside the cluster, it gives you a rate <coughs> of decay. If you then uh, take into account that a cluster at a given temperature has a distribution of energies, then it gives you back the Arrhenius decay law. So, uh, so it, it comes back to the same result we got in the previous explanation. There is a third explanation that is called the detailed balance explanation. And the detailed balance is, um, says the rate for a cluster to fragment is the same rate for the opposite process to happen, for an atom to attach to the cluster, except you have to take into account the density of states. Okay. So actually, for an atom to join the cluster, it's, a, it's actually a lower probability because you have a lot of density of states of a free atom. and So you have to take into account the density of states. And the entropy, no? The entropy as well. Yeah, so the density of states is entropy. Okay, log of density of states is the entropy. Okay, so when you do this, you once again get the same Arrhenius decay law, um, but with a small correction. So instead of the temperature here, then you have something called the emission temperature, which is the microcanonical temperature with some correction. So, um, okay, let's uh, take a small break. Uh, let's go come back at five o'clock. Continue. So I'll give you another 
intuition for what I mean by this small probability gives you the long time scales. So just imagine that you're in a maze, a a labyrinth, <coughs> okay? And it's a vet, and I drew here a very small labyrinth, but you imagine a very, very big and complicated labyrinth. And let's say you're moving along, and you're moving very quickly. You're, uh, you're Usain Bolt, and you're the fastest man alive, so you're running very quickly. But you're running, running in a random direction. It's, you don't have a map, you don't know what the right way is, so you're just running in a random direction. So even though you're moving very quickly, the time it will take you will be very, very long. And it's just a matter of probability. So it's, it's how fast you're moving times, how many steps on average does it take you to go, go out, get out of the labyrinth. And um, the more complicated the labyrinth, the longer these time scales will be. Um, so, so this is how probability gives you very long time scales. It also means that by measuring the time, you can measure the temperature. And this is something that very excited me as a student when I uh, read this and realized this because, temp because now we can measure temperature of something that's very, very small. Okay, you can take a cluster with four atoms. It, it has this phenomenon of delayed fragmentation. And then you can use the Serenius decay law and you can measure its temperature. So that's cool. Um, but it's not as easy as that, especially because when we talk about a decay rate, then we always assume that the decay is a single exponent. And what you measure in experiment is usually not a single exponent. You measure a power law. So what's going on? So you guys, from your questions, I already realized that most of you are already experts in this. But I'll, uh, but I'll uh, give you a short introduction into exponents and uh, power laws. So let's say that you have a system um, that has one state and decays into a different state, B. So uh, if you write the population of A as a function of time, then it will decay by some rate. So you're, you're always losing population from A as a function of how much population you have. And this is a differential <coughs> equation that's easy to solve. A will be A at time t0 times e to the minus kt. So this is an exponential decay. If you have money in the bank, and the bank is taking an interest from you instead of giving you interest, if it's taking an interest from you, then the amount of money you have will decay exponentially. And the way it looks, if you plot the plotted a as a function of time, and if this is a linear scale, then it looks like it looks like this. It looks like you lose all the money right away, and then for a long time you have zero money. If you plot it on a log scale, then it looks like a straight line. Okay? And this describes many things in physics. For example, it describes radioactive decay. Capacitor. Yeah, <laughs> uh, discharging of a capacitor. Many, many things. Uh, if you move in a friction, then your velocity decays um, exponentially. OK, let's say you have a system A that can go with one rate, k1, into B. And in a different rate, it can go into C. Then what will be the decay of A? Uh, <laughs> Sorry? Um, depends on which k is bigger than the other. I mean, which rate is. Uh, so will it be a single exponent? No, you'll have two, but no. eventually only one of them dominates. No. Yeah, so it turns out that in this case, dA over dt will be minus k1 plus k2 times a. So it will still be a single exponent, 
and the rate will be the sum of the two. Right, it means that they are not... Uh, not doesn't... Yeah, if you start from a single state, then even if you can decay by different channels, it's still a single exponent. Okay? When do you have more than one exponent? When you don't start from a single state. Okay? For example, if you start from A1 and A2, and this decays with one rate, K1, and this decays with a different rate, K2. <coughs> now if you... Um, so A1 will, will have uh, A1 at T0, and A2 Now, but if you can distinguish between A1 and A2, then you'll measure something that is a sum of two exponents. So, what, so if you can di dis distinguish between them, then you'll measure So this, on a log scale, it's easy to see if k1 and k2 are very different from each other. Let's say k1 is very large and k2 is very small. So it will look like this and like this. So here it looks straight, and here it looks straight, and in the middle it will be something in between. So this is a two exponent. So an example of a two exponent decay is if you make a molecule called Helium minus. Helium minus only has two states. Okay, it has the ground state and the excited state, and then it decays. Its decay looks like a perfect two exponent. Okay. What happens if you have more than two initial states? Let's say you have three states. What will you have? Three, three exponents. Okay. It just the okay, but I'll tell you. So, so yeah, it's like a free phase. If you have infinite number of exponents, it's like levy. Okay. So in principle, <coughs> if you have n initial states, then the decay you measure will be a sum of n exponents. Why do I say in principle? Because <coughs> in practice, there is no such thing <laughs> in measurements. If someone tells you he measured something and he fits it to a sum of three exponents, don't believe him. Okay? Maybe move forward. <laughs> don't believe him. Because when you try to fit exponents, then it's like there's these uh, stories about civilizations that uh, only had the words for one, two, and many. Okay. So you ask him how many uh, how many stones you have in your pocket, you will answer either one, two, or many. The same goes with fitting exponents. You you can fit a single exponent, you can fit two exponents, or you can fit many exponents. Okay. And. <coughs> So, 
So many exponents look like a power law. Okay? So if you have an exponent like this and an exponent like this and an exponent like this, then when you sum them all together, then you got something like this and it looks like a power law. Now sometimes it will look only like a power law in this region and here it will look like a single exponent that has it's the smallest of all the exponents you summed. But, uh, but usually in your experiment you, you can't measure many deca decades, so if you have many exponents it looks like a power law. So the question is, where do all these many exponents come from? And for that we'll need... Now, for that I need to remind you something about statistical mechanics and the idea of ensemble. Okay, so, so what is the idea of ensembles? So, when we do experiments on clusters, then every time we run a cluster and see a hit on the detector, then we actually measure a, a dissociation of a single particle. So we could say that we're measuring, we're doing experiments on single particles. But we're actually not doing experiments on single particles, we're doing because we repeat the experiment many, many times. So what we're doing is doing experiments on many copies of a single particle. Okay. And then the, the question is, are the copies all identical? Are all the copies identical, or, um, or is there some variation between them? Okay. So let's say I'm doing ex an experiment on students in a class, and every time I'm looking at one student, and I'm looking at his behavior, and let's also say that the students don't interact with each other, but... Um, Physicists. Yeah, they're <laughs> loners. They're, uh, they don't have any social skills. Sorry? Them to a heat yeah, they're always coupled <laughs> to some uh, pressure of exams and so on. So, um, so the question is, are all the students exactly the same? Or if they're not the same, what defines their distribution? Okay. So there is the, the one, so this is called an ensemble, okay? Like many copies of a single system. And there's many different ensembles that the difference between them is, um, is what defines the, the particles inside. So for example, there is the micro-canonical ensemble. And the micro-canonical ensemble is an ensemble where all the particles have exactly the same energy. So if you look at the distribution of energies, how much energy there is as a function of energy, it looks like a delta function. Now I must say that I don't remember who was my first teacher of statistical mechanics, but he taught me that the microcanonical ensemble is the correct ensemble. It's where you want to do, where you want, where, where everything interesting happens because there is conservation of energy in the world. But I want, would like to say that microcanonical ensemble is something that only exists in theory and never exists in experiment. Because you can never make particles that all have exactly the same energy. Whenever you do an experiment, there's always a distribution of energies. This is something that only happens in theory. Um, then there is the canonical 
ensemble. And the canonical ensemble says that the particles Particles are coupled to a heat bath. What is a heat bath? The heat bath is a <coughs> large system. Okay, any system that's large enough is a is a heat bath. And then the distribution of energies will go something like this. And it's defined by one number, which is called the canonical temperature. Uh, the the sex energy. The energy. Now, you can um, you can. This ensemble, the microcanonical ensemble, you can define something called temperature, and we call it the mi the microcanonical temperature. So it's not canonical temperature; it's the microcanonical temperature, and it's defined in the following way: you say that one over k Boltzmann T is equal to I'm sorry, I used the wrong letter here. This should be G of E. And rho is the density of state. So rho Okay, so now what is the idea behind these definitions? So what was the density of states, and um, and G is the population. But but rho is dependent on the, the dimension. Yeah. Right? So here it's constant. So I, I didn't say anything about the dimension of the system. So why is it always uh, better? I mean, uh, one of the okay, B team. Th what? That's the definition of microcanonical temperature. So what's the motivation of defining this temperature? Okay, so what is the motivation of defining this temperature? So let's ex explain it in a second. So the idea is the following. Let's start with the canonical ensemble. So I'll give you the intuition for those who didn't do statistical mechanics. So um, let's say you have a rock concert, and you have the singer here. Who will be our singer? Omer Adam or? <laughs> Too expensive. Sorry? It's too expensive. Let's say you have Omer Adam and you're in his concert. And, um, and what happens is that you would like to be as close to the stage as possible because you want to hear the Omer Adam. Um, so. <laughs> But uh, sometimes the crowd is pushing you around, and then you start to do random motion. Okay? Now, with zero temperature, then uh, no one's pushing you, so you can be as close to Omer Adam as you want. Okay? But if, you, uh, if people are starting to push you, 
then you're starting to do a random motion. Okay? Now, where will you be in this case? So you're in the, on the one hand, you want to be as close as possible, so you want to be as low as possible, but on the other hand, you're doing random motion, and then it really depends on the density of states. So if it's very, very high temperature, so you don't, so now you'll be randomly located anywhere here, but there's more probability for you to be high because here there is more states. Okay, so um, but so um, so if you plot where where are you going to be? So at low temperature you'll be over here. If you increase the temperature, then you start being a little higher. In average, so on average, yeah. And uh, the more you increase the temperature, then you'll be something like this. And what def so this is the same idea with with energy and entropy. Okay. So um, so this this will be so the distribution of states, the probability to be at a given state will go like the density of states times e to the minus um, yeah, yeah. <coughs> e divided by k Boltzmann t. So this is called, the, and it goes like this. So th this is the <coughs> occupation of a state, goes like this. And this proportionality, because you have to have, the integral has to be equal to 1. So it's this divided by the integral over energy of this. This is the canon canonical. This is the distribution of states in the canonical ensemble. Now what happens usually in most physical systems is that the rho increases the density of states, like in this diagram, it increases with energy. That, that depends on the dimension. In two dimensions it's constant. Yeah, so for, for example, for our, well it depends in on the system. In one dimension it decreases. It depends on the system and it depends on many things, but typically, in, usually in physical systems, rho increases with energy. Okay. So for example, if you have a one-dimensional harmonic oscillator, then the density of states is just one, no matter your energy. But if you have a two-dimension, then it increases. If it, you have three dimensions, it increases even faster. So, so um, So rho as a function of energy is something that usually grows like this and and this factor here e to the minus kbt is something that decreases exponentially so if you multiply them both together then you will have some distribution that looks like this and the peak of the distribution happens at this microcanonical temperature. Okay, so this is actually why you define the microcanonical temperature like this. So, but you have to specify an energy for that, right? Because yeah, so the microcanonical temperature means that all your molecules have, all your systems or clusters, they all have exactly the same energy, and you can give this energy Instead of saying their energy, you can give them a, you can convert them to a number that you call temperature. Okay. You call it the type T, the microcanonical temperature. Okay. Okay. Now the last thing that you, um, the last part of this small course on ensembles, is that. When you have very large systems, and you look at this distribution of energies, so this is G of E, and this is E, then the maximum scales like the number of particles, but the width, width goes like the square root of the number of particles. So if you take the maximum, sorry, the width, the 
divided by the maximum, this goes like 1 over the square root of the number of particles. So if n goes to infinity, this becomes uh, very, very narrow. And then the two ensembles, canonical and microcanonical, are the same. But for small systems like clusters or nanoparticles and so on, this is not very narrow. In fact, it's very wide. And that's when you say that the ensembles are not, um, not equivalent to each other. Okay, so how is this relevant to the experiments? They are not equivalent to each other. No, for small systems, canonical and microcanonical are very different. So in the microcanonical ensemble, distribution of energies look like this. In the canonical, it looks like this. Yes, but for, for a large system, it will converge to the same distribution. For, for large systems, this will look like this. Yes. For, but for small systems, it doesn't look like that. And then many of the things that you know from canonical experiments will not be true for small systems. Okay, so, um, so this now comes to the experiment. So what happens in the experiment? So let's say you have ions. You, you make them, and usually you can assign to them a temperature, which means that they're coupled to some heat bath. Okay, so they have... So let's say you make the molecules and you let them collide with the gas so they have a well-defined canonical temperature, which means that they have a distribution of energies. Now, if you fire a laser at them, then what you do is you shift this distribution to some higher energy. So now you have an ensemble that is not microcanonical and not canonical. It's, it's neither of them, it's something in between. Is that an equilibrium description? No. Now they're not in equilibrium. They're now in vacuum. They're not colliding with anything. So they started <coughs> in equilibrium, but now they're in, not in equilibrium. Okay. They're not coupled to anything. And they're in some ensemble that is not there and not, not here. Okay? Yeah. Now, if the photon energy excites them to an energy that's higher than the binding energy, they start decaying. And the molecules that have energies that are just a little bit about, so molecules that have energies that are below the binding energy will not fragment, will not decay. They will live forever. Molecules that have energies that are slightly above the binding energy, they'll decay, but very, very slowly. And molecules that have energies that are higher, they'll decay faster, and even higher, they'll decay immediately. And that gives you a sum of many exponents, and that's a power law. But why those with lower energy will not decay? Don't they tunnel or something? Like <coughs> yeah, but tunneling is, is much, much slower. Oh. Tunnel there are cases where tunneling is important. There are some papers about it. But usually it's, uh, it's way too long. Okay? So then you get a sum of many exponents, and you get a power law. Okay, now not only you get a power law, but there were some papers that say that you get a power law where the power is minus one. And, <coughs> and the idea is that if you do a sum of many exponents and you do the decay rate, then you're supposed to get, a, under some approximations, you're supposed to get a power of minus one. And they even showed very nice data on a cluster of silver with five atoms 
and you see it's, uh, it's very close to minus 1. It's minus 1.1. One. So that was a, it was a PRL. It made a lot of, yeah. I, so you yes yeah, so so, um, so you start with molecules and they absorb a photon so the energy of the photon adds to the energy already inside the cluster <coughs> so in, in the cluster you had some energy distribution now it's all shifted by the photon energy right okay but why would this cause the, the behavior of the power of ah okay so um, So let's say you now have a distribution of energies. Now for each given energy, you have a decay rate. Okay. So, um, so for instance, if your molecule has an energy that is smaller than the binding energy, then it won't decay. You don't have enough energy to decay. But all the molecules that have an energy that's higher than the binding energy, they'll decay. But those will decay faster and those will decay slower. Okay. So. Slow means a uh, long exponent, fast means a short exponent, so you get a sum of many exponents. <coughs> and, and, um, and then you get a power law. And there were people saying that the power law has to be minus one, and, and they even showed data that it's minus one. I think they were a little cheating in this paper because we later did the experiments on many different silver clusters. So silver cluster with four, five, six, seven, and five was the only one where it was close to minus one. The others, you get all kinds of different power laws. So, so, but why should it be one if we don't know anything? Yeah, so, so you, can, um, you can approximate. Um, so if the distribution of states is very wide, so you can take it as constant, and then it's, it's really easy to show an approximation that it's 1 over t. But it's wrong. I mean, it's, it's true only for specific cases. OK. Why does the decay stop before uh, the binding energy? Sorry? Why does the decay stop before the binding energy? No, no, so what I'm saying is that all of these molecules that have an energy lower than the binding energy, they won't decay. Okay. Okay, if you don't have enough energy, you don't decay. So there the are um, stable states? Yeah. Like before. Uh, okay. 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 <laughs> so now if you understand all of this, then you can model this decay and you can extract the temperature of systems. So I'll, I'll show you a beautiful experiment that I think it's beautiful because I made, I did it. <laughs> but, uh, so let's say you have a cluster and it's very hot and you fire a laser at it, it starts to fragment. <coughs> so, it, um, so you get a fast decay. But then you let the cluster cool down a little bit. Okay? So what you do is you trap it and you produce it very hot and then you store it in the trap and it cools down a little bit. Uh, so now it's not as hot and then if you fire a laser it cools down, it, it takes it longer to cool down. So it's, it's not a single exponent, it's a power law, but you can see it decays slower. And then um, you can wait a little more and it cools down more and you, you see it's even slower, but you can also see that, that from here to here there's a big difference and from here to here it's a small difference. So it's cooling down, but in the beginning it's cooling fast, and then it's cooling slow. So you can, you can keep on going, and uh, then you can fit it to this uh, complicated model, and you can get the temperature as a function of time. So this is a way you can put a temperature on a, on a system, in this case a system with four atoms. So uh, I was very proud, and uh, when we did this experiment, and then um, so it only decays by emitting radiation, and we know that large systems emit radiation according to the Stefan-Boltzmann law. 
So uh, it goes like their temperature to the power of 4. And here, is, so you can fit it and you get that it goes like the temperature to the power of 3.5. So, uh, so that's nice. But I must say that this is not a very good way of extracting the temperature because you have to fit it to this very complicated model that has many, many parameters. And also fitting to a, a sum of many exponents is always very problematic. So there's also other ways where you can uh, measure temperatures and uh, do things, uh, not, not by the time scale, but in other ways. For example, one of the nice things is if you have a cluster and you put in, and if it's hot, then it will start evaporating, but may, sometimes it will evaporate more than one atom. It will evaporate two or three or four or something like that. And then you can measure the temperature by how many uh, atoms it evaporated. So, um, yeah. You had said uh, your uh, temperature goes as uh, uh, 3.5. So him, if I get a bigger, bigger uh, cluster, it will go to four. It got to four. It, how it will go? Like uh, fractal or? I don't know. I uh, I, I don't know. I, uh, I n this was uh, I never got to do this experiment on other sizes of clusters. So because I don't know. But two, it's like one dimensional. I, so yeah. I, I don't have a good intuition for that. It's a good question. So, um, <coughs> so here's one of the classical experiments on uh, measuring temperature by how many molecules are coming out. So in this case, what they did is they made clusters that have this molecule inside with water molecules attached to it. Many, many water molecules attached to it. For, so in this case, they had 50 water molecules attached to it. And, um, and they, call, they, they had a very, uh, a very uh, controversial name to their paper. They said what they're doing is weighing photon energies. Okay? I'll tell you why, it's, uh, why they use this concept of weighing. So, in principle, if you have a f uh, cluster and it absorbs a photon, then according to Einstein, a photon, it has an energy, and this energy will cause an increase in your mass, because E is equal to mc squared. Okay? So, in principle, if you absorb a <coughs> photon, then your mass goes up. If you emit a photon, your mass goes down. Okay? But... This is very hard to measure because for a visible photon, then the increase in mass is, uh, is too small for any practical measurement. People are working on it. Okay? They're making mass spectrometers uh, using this uh, penning traps that use huge magnets, and they say that one day they'll have the resolution to measure it. Where you can actually see it is in nuclear physics. In nuclear physics, you can you can have photo, gamma ray photons, and they already have a, that's like a big change in mass. So that's really easy to measure. But visible photons, it's not possible yet. But they did something where you uh, could measure the weight of a photon by mass spectrometry. But, so that's what's, what their name is about. And here's the idea. So you have a molecule, and you have 50 water molecules attached to it. And now you shoot a photon it, on it, and because it absorbed the photon, it starts throwing off water molecules. Um, so sometimes it's, it throws out one, sometimes two, sometimes more. Um, and then what they see is that this distribution goes down, and then up again, and then down, and then up again. So what happens here? What they claim is the following thing. So if, you, if the molecule was very, very hot, then it fragments and throws out a lot of molecules. And then you, it throws out 50 minus 39, that's 11 <coughs> molecules go out. But if you absorb a photon and then you fluoresce, you emit a photon, then you cool down. And then you don't, you don't throw out 11 water molecules, you'll only throw out one or two. So this is a way that you can uh, 
measure the temperature and measure cooling because of fluorescence and by measuring how many molecules come up. And Sorry? Can you explain this again? Yeah, so you have a, a molecule like this. It can be any molecule you want. And you have 50 atoms attached to it. Okay? Um, so now if, if you heat it up, and all it does is it's hot and it starts evaporating atoms, then it will evaporate a lot of mo uh, evaporate water molecules, and it will evaporate a lot of them. So it will uh, evaporate 30. 11 water molecules, you'll, you'll stay with 39 or 38 or something like this. But if before you converted into heat, before you became very hot, if before that you did fluorescence, fluorescence means you emitted a photon, then you cooled, then a lot less energy remains in your, in your molecule, so you're much less hot. And then you only evaporate a small number of water molecules. And in fact, you can, the guy doing this experiment, he, he knew exactly what's the binding energy of each water molecule, so he could exactly tell uh, how much fluorescence happened um, by how many water molecules came up. Yeah, so, so, uh, so it's, um, so you could absorb, could see the effect of uh, fluorescence by uh, measuring the mass. And here comes to your question that uh, then you could do it as a function of how many water molecules and study and how, how it arrives at the bulk value. Okay, now the most, uh, if you can do measure temperature of small systems, the most ambitious and uh, exciting experiment I think you can do is to study phase transitions. And so, I'll, so I think now we can go a little more into details on experiment I showed you in, in the first lecture about cluster melting. So what is the idea? Maybe let's do it on the board. That this that you can define the microcanonical temperature in this way through the density of states. And the density of states normally goes up. So if you plot flow of sorry. And it normally goes up. And that means that if you, from this, you calculate the temperature as a function of energy, then this will normally be, <coughs> li be linear. You said that you define this energy for a given, uh, you said that you define this temperature for a given energy, so why is it, is it uh, changing? Yeah, so for each energy, you can, you can get the microcanonical temperature. And if you increase the energy, then normally, this is a normal situation, then the temperature goes up. But why would it be linear? Well, I mean, um, you have to assume a specific <coughs> uh, density of state. Yeah, so... I mean, so um, so in three, a free particle in three dimensions, it should... 
density of states is like the square root of the energy? Sorry, it's uh, ln of all, sorry. Right? Oh, okay. So then, uh, oh, okay. Okay. Okay, so, so I, I'm sorry about the mistake before. So, um, so it's, it's the derivative of the, this okay, may be, makes, okay. Okay. <laughs> okay, now you can makes. also see that from here it's T, okay, never mind. D, D is S, D, yeah. D, T, D, S, which is the yeah. actual yeah, so yeah, so ds is equal to tds is equal to d. Yeah, so can you uh, oh, yeah. So the intuition here is that, uh, I'm sorry. So the intuition here is that rho explodes very rapidly, but if you take the log of rho, which is the entropy, then it will actually be linear, and then uh, the temperature will also be linear. Or maybe this is parabolic. This is, no, this is logarithmic. Yeah. So because. The density of state is some power law of, of the energy. So we would have something logarithmic for the entropy, and then that would be linear. Yeah. So, and then if you look at the heat capacity, which is dE over dT, so that's the slope of the temperature divided by energy, then this will be just a constant. This is the normal... And usually this constant is three times the number of degrees of freedom. So this is the normal situation. But things are not always normal. So let's say You have some complicated potential energy surface. Like this. So, at, in the beginning, at low energies, then you're in this potential well. And when you heat it up, then it's as if you're in a single harmonic oscillator. So it behaves perfectly like these points over here. But once you get to this energy over here, then you're not, a sum, you're not in a single harmonic oscillator, you're now in a sum of two. And that means that you jumped, so, so um, your density of states was, goes like this, but at this point suddenly it's a sum of two, of two contributions. And that means that the derivative will suddenly explode. And then there's another point that's crazy, and this is this point. Okay? So here it's like a sum of two minus the overlap between them. And these are points where suddenly the heat capacity becomes, should become crazy. Can you explain again the point uh, uh, when the derivative explodes, and you said that, that there is a point that is the, um, the capacity should be infinite. No? Yeah, it should be. Uh, it's it's not analytic, so it should be crazy. Because I might be staying on in exactly this point, so I won't. Yeah. Should it diverge or just could it be just discontinuous? So it should be it should be crazy at this point mathematically. Okay. No. Now, experimentally, <coughs> so all this is true for the microcanonical ensemble. 
But for the canonical ensemble, for small systems, what happens is you have, you take all these curves over here and you have to smear them on, on a wide distribution of energies. So all these sharp features and principles should be washed away and you shouldn't be able to see them. Okay? Except that it is possible to see them in experiments for large enough clusters. Okay? And in particular, when you have a very a system with many many barriers that have a sim single similar energy then once you cross this you have a phenomena that's like melting why is this like melting so when you're here you have a cluster that has a very uh, rigid structure every atom is in the same position but once you cross these barriers then this means that the atoms can now move freely and freely in the cluster. It can change shape. It can be in this shape, or this shape, or this shape, or this shape. And this is melting. Okay? Yeah, so suddenly you, you start from a given uh, structure, so with very small degrees of freedom, and suddenly you cross a barrier where you can have many, many degrees of freedom because the cluster can change structure very rapidly. Okay? And then you should see the temperature as a function of energy um, doing stuff like this. If I have, uh, for example, uh, uh, bigger and bigger uh, maximas, so I have many phases? Yeah, and then your phase transition will be smeared. Okay, so <coughs> you, when you sum up everything, it's smeared, and then you don't see a sharp phase transition. You see something very wide, and then it's hard to see it. possible to have a, a rigid body in, in the micro I mean in the canonical uh, ensemble because yeah, there's I a mean possibility for every, for every state so yeah. yeah but okay when you're at very low temperatures then some states are more probable but still it's uh, yeah so at, lo at zero temperature you have only one state right yeah. at low temperatures you you still ha you're still in one state Actually, many times you have to reach very high temperatures to, to move between states. back to these experiments that I told you about um, Hubble. And so, so, so this is how this would look if you do an experiment on a huge system, on a bulk system. So let's say you have a glass of water and you increase the energy, the temperature goes up. But at a certain point you increase the energy and the temperature doesn't go up. Why? Because the extra energy is, needs to break the lattice. Um, so, so you so it looks like you're putting in more and more energy, but the temperature is not going up. And then if you look at the heat capacity, the heat capacity is not analytic at this point. Is that the yes. specific heat or something? Like that? Yeah. Um, specific heat is specific heat. Yeah, not specific. Latent heat. Yeah, so this is the latent heat, this amount of energy that you need to put in to, uh, to destroy the lattice. And it turns out that they managed to do this experiment also for clusters. So they managed to do ju just this experiment, measure the temperature as a function of energy, and, uh, and you see it's, here you start from a solid, you increase the, the temperature, the energy goes up, but then you reach this point now it's not as sharp as this drawing over here, but still you see a nice uh, phase transition over here. And, um, and what happens is you start here in a cluster that has a very def definite shape. You start heating it up, it starts vibrating. 
But when you reach this temperature, and you can see it's not a very small temperature, it's uh, 270 degrees Kelvin, then suddenly you go into this transition where it starts melting. So how did they do the experiment? So this is the idea. You make the cluster, and you set its temperature by collisions with the gas. So it has a well-defined initial temperature. <coughs> and then you fire a laser at it. And because it, because it absorbs the laser, it throws out atoms. And this is what you measure. So it throws out a few single atoms, a few two atoms, then three atoms, four atoms, five atoms, and like this. And what you see is oscillations here. And the reason it oscillates is because um, we use a high laser power. So if you absorb three photons, then this is the number of atoms you throw out. But if you absorb four, four atoms, then you throw out more atoms. If you absorb four photons, you throw out more atoms. Okay, so, so this is five, at, five photons, six photons, and so on. Now they change the initial temperature. If they increase the temperature, then the cluster is hotter, and this whole distribution will move to the side. If they increase the temperature more, then it moves even more. And, sorry? No, it shifts. It, it shifts. Now, if they increase the temperature enough so that this goes here, then they know that this change in temperature is like a change in energy of one photon. Okay? So this allows them to measure to correlate energy and temperature. So this is how it looks. They have this distribution. So what you see here is one line. And then they increase the tem temperature, and you see this distribution moves. So if it moves <coughs> by this distance, then they know that, it's, uh, that this change in temperature is like changing energy by one photon. But the crazy thing is that they see <coughs> this going like this. And when they analyze the data, they even see that the energy as a function of temperature goes up, and then down, and then up again. And this is something that, according to the laws of thermodynamics, shouldn't be possible. Because in this region, you increase the energy, and the temperature goes down. This is called negative heat capacity. And according and what's the point is, in the canonical ensemble, heat capacity can never be negative. But this is not a canonical ensemble because it's a, it's a small cluster. So heat capacity can become negative. How, uh, but the temperature here is a canonical, is a... Yeah, but I mean, so you start from a canonical ensemble, but then you add the photon, so now you're not in the canonical ensemble so, anymore. So there's, I mean, so you're just out of equilibrium. You, you start, but then you shift everything, and once you shift, then you're not in a, you're not in equilibrium so anymore. This temperature, I mean, so I don't understand what this temperature means because, I mean, either you're in equilibrium and you have a specified temperature, or you're not in equilibrium. Yeah, so this was the initial temperature of the cluster, not the final one. Anyway, so this is the idea. They, uh, they claim that, that they managed to prove that in some cases you could see in the phase transition a negative heat capacity. This caused a lot of uh, excitement, and we don't know of any applications, but in principle you can think about uh, if you want to have systems that you heat them up and they cool cooled down, then uh, maybe you can use some ensembles of uh, nanoparticles that have negative heat capacity. Yeah, and, and maybe I'll, I'll tie it into the last thing we talked about, that um, they, then they could do this experiment on clusters from all different sizes. So you can do it on a cluster of, this is an experiment on a cluster with 139 atoms, but if you go to a cluster with 142 atoms, the melting temperature becomes a lot higher. And then if you go increase the size, then suddenly the temp melting temperature goes a lot smaller. And these are really big differences. Um, Maybe take a different geometrical shape. Yeah. 
So, um, so what turns out is really it has to do with the shape of the clusters. So when you have a number like 55, when the cluster has a really nice shape, then first of all, it's a very stable cluster, so its melting temperature will be, be very high. <coughs> also, because it's so symmetric, then all these barriers for melting will all be at the same level because of the symmetry. So you will have a very sharply defined phase transition. Like the buckyballs to study. Yeah, the buckyball, nobody managed to measure its melting, but its melting will be huge because it's... And it will be very sharp transition. Sorry? With 70 carbon also. Yeah, it's... But... So every time you form one of these nice symmetric shapes, then the melting temperature becomes very high, and the latent heat becomes very high because it's, uh, it's very symmetric, so all the barrier energies are the same, and you get a very sharp phase transition. And when you go away, then it, uh, it goes down, and they could actually model this very, very nicely. Good. I think we'll stop here, even though... Uh, Next week, or do you know who... I think this is the last one. Uh, I was told by Yossi that I also need to write you an exercise. <laughs> so you'll have an exercise. It won't be very hard. If you want, we won't. I really enjoyed uh, this class, mainly because you have so many good questions. Keep on this way, and thank you very much. Thank you.